So please welcome to Google Detroit, Mrs. Christy Hedges. Well, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, I mentioned in, in the bio intro, um, so you wrote a book previously called um, The Power of Presence. Right. And this book is called The Inspiration Code. Um, are you able to kind of kick things off by just telling us a little bit about how those two things or those two books are similar and perhaps how they're different, right? Presence versus inspiration, they tie together, but there's obviously differences between them. Maybe kick things off with that and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. So, well, well, let me start by saying how I ended up writing this book. Absolutely. That, that's how they're, they're kind of tied together. Sure. Uh, so, I wrote The Power of Presence and it came out in 2011. Uh, and that's really a book about influence. How do we use our presence to influence situations around us? Uh, and as I was out talking to groups about that, I would start by asking them this simple question to kind of warm up the audience a little bit, get people talking, uh, and that was, uh, who inspired you and what did they do? And I was trying to map those uh, answers and those characteristics back to people who had presence and make this real life connection for people. But what I noticed when I asked that question uh, pretty immediately was no matter how tired people were, maybe it's the day after a holiday weekend or something <laughs> like that, uh, when they would start talking about these people who inspired them, their faces would light up and there would be all this animation and energy in the room uh, and people would be literally transformed energetically in front of me. Uh, and that happened again and again and again and again and people would talk as part of the exercise about what these people did. Uh, and I noticed that they communicated in certain ways uh, that inspired people. I mean to even remember things and you guys have them now. Somebody said something to you that just hits you just right and those words you carry them around and you, you use them when you need them and they um, fortify you when you, you sort of need guidance and all those kinds of good things. Uh, and I just started writing down what did these people do and I found that these patterns just emerged again and again. Uh, and that led me to put them together in, uh, in the inspiration code. Uh, but as I looked at those, because I was usually there uh, speaking to groups to talk about presence, to talk about influence, which is really important. Uh, but what we, um, in leadership development programs, we often rely so much on influence that we leave out this other piece about engagement, which is inspiration. Uh, and if you think about it, we need both of them as leaders, but they go hand in hand. I mean, none of us go home after a day of work and say, I had such a great day today, I was influenced all day long, <laughs> right? I mean, that it feels different. Influence is done to us, but we would go home and say, I was so inspired today, I had a great day. Uh, inspiration comes from within. So uh, I really wanted to figure out how to create those feelings in people in the workplace because we need more of it. Yeah, absolutely. Y you, so one of the really interesting things that I read about in the book is this kind of the quiet influence of listening, right? Mm -hmm. So we talk about inspiration. When you think yeah. about an inspirational per person, you think of uh, a great speaker or somebody with presence, right? Uh, one of the things you mentioned, though, is one of the most cited behaviors of somebody who is inspiring is the ability to listen. Like, can you talk a little bit more about that? It seems like a simple thing, right? Listening, everyone should be able to do it, but it's not really that easy of a concept to handle. A lot of people aren't good at listening. Can you talk about how listening kind of plays into inspiration and also how we can work on becoming better listeners in order to be more inspirational mm -hmm. with the folks that we lead? Yeah, th that was a surprise to me. So as yep. part of the research that I did, I also did uh, quantitative research that I commissioned on my own. And I looked at what are the behaviors that uh, were most impactful to people in terms of inspiration, and the number one behavior was listening. Uh, and I also heard in, in these discussions, uh, people would say, that person was there for me. Uh, they made time for me. They were focused on me. Uh, that came up again and again and again. So it was clear that there was just something magical about when somebody creates a space for us uh, through strong listening skills. Uh, so whether you're in sales or whether you're leading teams, uh, when we listen to people, it's a sign of respect for their opinion. It's a sign that we care. Uh, there is a, a great quote that uh, the currency of love is time uh, and I would say the currency of respect is attention. Uh, so when we give people our attention it feels different but we're not very good listeners as a group, right? We learn to listen quick and listen halfway so we can get done what we need to get done and that's why when somebody really listens to us it's sort of like the record skips and it just feels quite different. Yeah and I think uh, another concept you talk about too is authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've all encountered leaders who 
most likely read a leadership book uh, and that's pretty much it. But there's no authenticity to it, right? Because they're just kind of spitting back something that they read about, uh, you know, being a powerful speaker or giving someone a strong handshake, right? That mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily equate to authentic leadership. It's just something they read about in a, look at, in a book. And I think listening is one of those aspects uh, that actually conveys authenticity, right? Um, can you talk about this kind of concept of authenticity as well? Uh, not just reading a book about leadership and, and kind of spitting it back to your employees, but how you actually can become an authentic leader in addition to kind of the, the listening that we talked about, some other concepts around that. Yeah, well, I mean, listening, I mean, authenticity really is, uh, it's about trust when it comes down to us. Sure. You know, we trust people who are real. So if we don't feel like we actually know someone, then it's, it's very difficult for us to really invest in them. Um, but authenticity is tricky at work, right? People can be too authentic as well. <laughs> so it's just trying to figure out what that fine line is of uh, you're authentic enough so that we know you. Uh, and yet you're also you know, aware of your surroundings and what, and what the situation will support. Uh, and so uh, with authenticity, what I will often will tell people is that you know, we have to, it really has to start within you. Like, what is your intention for what you want to get across? And, and being very clear about what I call uh, your personal presence brand, which is really your values worn on the outside. How do I want to show up? Uh, how do I want people to perceive me? How do I want to um, show what's most important to me? If you're very clear about that going in, then you're much more likely for that to come out in an authentic way because it, it really is about the core of who you want to be in that situation. Uh, but situational uh, awareness matters too. So also knowing um, what those, the room will support because sometimes we get into too, you know, too much information, the TMI situation sure. where, uh, whoa, your authenticity is screaming at me, you know, yeah. we'll kind of back it back up. <laughs> yeah, we, when we talk about um, TMI, uh, sometimes emotion comes into to the discussion as well in, in terms of leadership and authenticity. Um, Google is, is known for kind of coming up with this concept of search inside yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, which is this concept based on kind of mindfulness and emotion uh, within the workplace. And um, not a lot of companies were really thinking about this, like how does this play into kind of the ecosystem of the workplace. But I think it's kind of a core, emotion is, is a core aspect of leadership that a lot of folks don't necessarily grasp. How do you, how do you tie emotion into leadership without being unauthentic? How do you do it uh, mm -hmm. in a way that um, kind of displays uh, sincerity. Uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of the importance of mindfulness or, or emotion within kind of the, the aspects of leadership? Yeah, well, the, uh, you know, I just wrote a piece for Harvard Business Review, which is a believe going online this week called Go Ahead, Get Emotional at Work. Uh, and, <laughs> Perfect. Uh, <laughs> Perfect timing, right? right? And <laughs> yeah. the idea was uh, the fact that in, in my world with, with coaching and leaders that I coach, it's, it's not that people are bringing too much emotion in, they're not bringing enough emotion in. Uh, and you know, emotion is really a signal for us, it's a trigger. Uh, to understand really what you care about. So if a leader comes in and they're overly stoic, you know, it's, it was like, a, what's there, knock, knock, knock. You know, you're looking for what the, what the real story is. Uh, and so emotion is actually something we want to be very strategic about as leaders because if we want people to feel something, we have to bring it. So if I want people to get excited, I have to bring excitement into a room. If I want people to feel serious, I have to bring seriousness into a room. So knowing what emotion you're trying to impart and instead of trying to either if have it be an afterthought to make it really important part of your communication is really what that's about. So it's uh, knowing what that emotion is and then being willing to put it out there. And uh, instead of, you know, a lot of us kind of come up through the ranks uh, learning that we want to be unemotional at work. We don't want to show, we want to be always stoic, you know, have the same demeanor no matter what people throw at us. Uh, and as an individual contributor, we get rewarded for that. Uh, and we're told, oh gosh, you can give Jason anything. He's going to, you know, he's always has a smile on his face, no matter what you dump on his lap, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, and then you get to be a leader, and that doesn't work so well anymore because you have to use emotion to get people excited, to make them feel something, and, and being able to actually think about, oh gosh, how should I be emotional at work versus not having emotion be something that we really think about. Yeah. I, I feel like we sometimes at Google encounter the opposite of that as mm -hmm. well, though, where when you're an individual, Individual contributor, an individual contributor, or you're newer to the company, company you bring more emotion, right? You're like, oh, I'm, mm, I'm at Google, yeah, this is yeah. exciting. People are more emotional, they're more emotional in their interactions with their managers. 
But then as you progress and you become part of the leadership team, maybe you're a manager or you manage a team or you're a director, you feel like you have to be more serious and more stoic and you actually remove the emotion because you want to be respected and authoritative versus you know an individual contributor that's a little bit more free and open. You see that mm -hmm. as well as being kind of a concept that comes across in inspiration where when folks get into a position of leadership, they actually lose some of those traits of, of a good leader because they feel they have to based on maybe an antiquated vision of what a leader is. Yeah, well, exactly, right? And yeah. so I love that example where people come in and they're like all gung-ho sure. and then as a leader, like, Young let's, and tamp, excited, let's yeah. tamp that down. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Uh, gosh, we don't want our leaders to be excited. Yeah, you know? exactly, yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of funny as we talk about it, but you, you see that play out. There's, you know, as you say that, it just it makes me think about how we think about, we equate joy, a joyfulness at work with naivete. Sure. Uh, and, and that doesn't serve us very well. Because uh, wouldn't it be great to have leaders who were actually joyful about the work that they did um, versus coming in and feeling like it's a grind every day? Uh, that, that doesn't inspire anybody. So uh, it, it's really thinking, again, we don't think about things on an emotional plane very much, but if, if you just think about it as a leader what, you know, and play around with the idea of motion as being a critical part of how you communicate, then it opens up a lot that maybe we don't even think we have. Sure. Can you talk, kind of tying that topic together too, so your book talks a lot about inspiring others. Um, can you maybe kind of turn that inward a bit and talk about how leaders, so folks here in the room, folks that are watching, who are in positions of, of influence or leadership, how they can inspire themselves from a, mm -hmm. a leadership perspective. How can they, if maybe they're one of these more stoic leaders and, yeah. and something just, you know, the, the last comment you made, something snapped in them and said, hey, wait, I'm one of these stoic leaders. How can I inspire myself to be a little bit more uh, joyful, more mindful, more emotional work? What are some practices or ways that folks who are in a position of leadership can, can inspire themselves? Well, everything that uh, I wrote in the book uh, that inspires other people also inspires you. And I'll be sure. honest, that didn't even hit me until the end of the book. So I was writing it and then, wait a minute, we can use these things on ourselves. Sure. Uh, and, and that's great because that, that's the idea. It's a virtuous cycle. So when we inspire other people, we also get inspired and it, and it all plays into the same thing. Uh, but for example, one of the, the top ways that well, we were saying that earlier that people get inspired is through conversation, through communication with other people. Uh, you can get inspired reading your email, but you probably won't. Uh, it's probably, you know, it's sitting like this, listening to other people talk, um, thinking about things. I know you guys do a lot of that at Google, bringing ideas in from the outside, just to, to expand your mind a little bit and get you to think differently. Uh, and, and so, you know, with leaders that I work with often, they'll get to a place where, you know, they've achieved a great level of success, but they just don't feel all that inspired anymore about it. Uh, and then I'll ask, well, who do you talk to during the day? And they talk to the same people. They talk to their management team. They might go out and talk to some customers occasionally. Uh, they talk to the board, um, whatever the case is. But they don't actually have any new inputs coming in. And, and so to, to really go out and seek inspiration, to find people to have conversations with, to if you don't have any role models, to find some. Because they might not be sitting around the office. Uh, you might have to look outward for that. Uh, and to put yourself in places that just really help you open your mind uh, can be a great pathway to inspiration. Sure. You speak, obviously you're here at Google today, you speak to a lot of other companies, you mm -hmm. speak at schools, you speak at businesses. Are there any kind of really interesting techniques that you've absorbed from speaking at these different places? Uh, folks that are doing, I guess either A, a really great job mm -hmm. of inspiring their employees or their students or, or whatever it may be, or on the flip side, B, doing a really poor job and doing it <laughs> maybe in a forceful way yeah. or an inauthentic way as we discussed earlier. Well, I'll tell you something that uh, that I see a lot. So I don't, you know, and I'm not calling out anybody yeah, in this. If you see names. yourself in this, then then there yeah. you go. Uh, is that companies spend a lot of money and time on corporate mission statements and corporate visions, uh, and it's not that they don't matter because they do matter. They just don't matter enough, uh, and they don't look at what are the conversations that are happening every day in organizations between managers and their people and teams, and you know what is the you know, I always say that like, cultures are really just stories built upon stories in the organization. There, there aren't enough sort of fresh stories getting into the mix about things that are working and things that 
um, solutions that are being overcome. And so they really hang their hat on this beautiful mission statement. Uh, and yet everybody in the organization doesn't buy it because the culture doesn't support it. So I see a lot of that, where we, we look at the very high level, the, sort of the grand ideas of inspiration. And we've heard that you have to have a great vision, so we check that box. And we spend a lot of money checking that box. And then we just wait for everybody's behavior to change. Uh, and it doesn't really get embedded down to the individual level. I mean, what inspires us is our day-to-day -day interactions with the people around us. Sure. Um, what are some common mistakes people make? Uh, we've talked a lot about the positive things that people can do. Mm -hmm. We've talked about authenticity as maybe, I guess, a mistake. But are there other things that uh, you see people making on a daily, monthly, weekly basis, mm -hmm. uh, mistakes that, that good leadership uh, folks that should know better are actually making, uh, mistakes that we can kind of understand and avoid learning from, from past mistakes, I suppose? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, well, you know, it's one we just talked about at lunch, and I'll just bring it up because it's very, yeah, very please. current, uh, is that uh, one of the most inspiring conversations a leader can have is to be in talks with their people about their teams, about their purpose. So helping them really identify how is your purpose for yourself um, being played out and being supported in the, in the position that you're in. Now that seems like a really grand conversation, but it doesn't have to be. So just talking about contextualized purpose. So how does what you're doing today but just help you take a couple steps further along in your development? It can be that simple. Uh, but often managers don't want to be in that conversation because they're worried that's going to have some, their, their, their uh, you know, team member's going to have an epiphany and then go out the door. Uh, with that. And so they don't want that to happen. So like, well, I'm not going to have that purpose conversation because I might lose them. Uh, and, and that's a real missed opportunity uh, because, first of all, we love when people engage us in that larger question um, because we're thinking about it or we want to be thinking about it. Sure. Uh, and somebody creates a space for us that's very meaningful. Uh, and then also, often there are um, way, things that you don't see that, uh, that somebody around you might see that can pull some threads together and help you understand that, let's say you're working in a in a company that's very chaotic. Um, well, that chaos might be really teaching you how to manage a lot of complexity, which you're going to need for the next level of your career. So somebody can help you see that. All of a sudden, that chaotic environment isn't a grind just to manage through every day. It's a, it's a huge learning opportunity. And you may not see that yourself. So being, being willing to be in those conversations is quite powerful. Sure, and we yeah. don't have them enough. Yeah. Oftentimes, people want to build on the base of what they have without analyzing that base, right? So mm -hmm. how can I be more inspiring? I'll do A, B, and C without fixing what was wrong in the first place. So we, we often yeah. look at how you can improve upon what you're currently doing, and then once you feel like you've kind of fixed that base, then you proceed with some of the tips from, from the book in terms of how you can inspire and become better yourself. Um, a lot of the book talks uh, kind of in context of uh, you know inspiring in a, in a corporate setting. Um, are there ways that you can take a lot of these kind of um, topics and themes and apply them outside of the, the corporate world as well? Yes, I mean, everything in the book uh, works in any environment you're in. So uh, I have found myself starting to use these at home with my kids a lot more sure. <laughs> as I've done the research. That's what I'm asking, yeah. This yeah. might work. Yeah. Uh, let me think about that. Sure. Uh, and it's great, they do. Uh, and so it doesn't matter if you're trying to, I mean, there's a lot of inspiration going on in communities right now. There's a lot of inspiration going on in Detroit yeah, right now. Of course, yeah, we talked about uh, that. And, and so, you know, using these kinds of ideas about what really gets people inspired, what lights up, you know, lights people up, uh, it's in any group you're you can imagine it's it's your teams at work, it's your communities at home, it's the your schools that you're working in. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's it's the same stuff, which is, is the beauty of it, right? I love yeah. when things apply at work and apply at home, uh, and that's really what I, I tried to do last time um, with the power of presence too. It doesn't really matter where you have presence; it's all the same yeah. result. We talked a little bit right before we hopped on stage here about uh, how inspiration can be contagious, and we talked about mm -hmm. the city of Detroit, which we're all located in right now. Uh, and how Detroit has seen better days, but what happened was there was a few inspired individuals who started to kind of apply inspiration to a certain, their house, to a, a neighborhood, a street, uh, whatever it may be, and it spread very quickly, right? We saw this inspiration spread mm -hmm. very quickly. Um, and I feel like that same concept, uh, this, this took place in a major US city, that same concept can also be applied to the workplace, right? So if you're in an uninspired workplace, having a few individuals that bring inspiration, that, that learn how to be inspiring individuals, it can catch on and it can be contagious as well, right? Absolutely. And I sit here with my Shinola watch on, right? So Beautiful. supporting Detroit. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, we were saying, I've been lurking, watching Detroit for years and yeah. just rooting for Detroit and just so inspired by what's happening sure. here. 
so, so there is actually a, um, a scientifically researched, well-researched uh, theory called emotional contagion. And so we always sort of think about it just in layman's terms as, you know, kind of you catch somebody's bad mood. Don't bring people down, right? Debbie Downer, we catch people's bad moods or, or whatever the case is. But it, it's actually verifiable. As humans, we, we do pick up the moods of other people. Uh, and we develop as groups what, what sociologists call group affect, which is we kind of we kind of go towards the center of whatever the mood is in a particular organization. Uh, now, leaders actually have more power to shift that mood than anybody else because people may pay more attention to leaders. We pay attention up the hierarchy. So if a leader is cynical, the group's going to feel cynical. If the leader's optimistic, we're going to feel optimistic. Uh, and so absolutely, it, it is contagious. So, but you need those people to come in and be the brave ones, to be the beachhead for whatever emotion is that you're trying to, to get people to impart. Uh, and of course, there's safety in numbers. So if you get a, a few people really excited, then that, that tends to, to change the dynamic of a much larger organization. Uh, but it has to start with somebody. Sure. And we talked about in the, the city of Detroit, Dan Gilbert, not by, by far, <clears throat> excuse me, not the only person, but obviously one of the figureheads of, of some positivity around Detroit. And he instilled a lot of inspiration in people by investing a lot of his money into the city. Mm -hmm. and, and again, a lot of people, when they saw that happen, uh, a lot of folks who were outside the city or in the city who hadn't necessarily invested now are investing time and money to help kind of inspire the city as well. So Dan Gilbert's one that, that comes to mind in Detroit. Do you have any other leaders that, that kind of are inspiring to you, folks that uh, it, either in your hometown or folks in your industry, uh, other authors that have kind of really embraced this idea of inspiration and presence and, and authenticity, folks that have really inspired you? Well, I, I'm in Washington, D.C., so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lots of inspiration there, there. Yeah, of course. It's a lot of inspiration, yeah. all kinds of different ways. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, so yes, I mean, I get inspired by people all the time. And, uh, and I'll just tell you personally, for me right now, um, I'm quite inspired by people who are maybe 20 years further along in their career than I am. Uh, because I'm starting to look and think, okay, this next um, phase of my life, like how can I be most inspiring in that and use my talents and do the things that <laughs> Um, that I think are going to be important beyond myself. Uh, and I'm very inspired by people who've been there before. And, and role modeling is just, it's such a huge, we talked about earlier too, it, 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 role models are inspiring to us because they create a vicarious experience for us. So when we see somebody like Dan Gilbert come in and, and do that, um, we're inspired because we see him do something and we think, well, I could maybe do that too. So I, maybe I can't sure. you know, buy a whole building, um, <laughs> but maybe I could put a couple of my, my people in that building. Yep. Right, so we, we make another step, and, and that's what role models do for us. So uh, I'm really looking at uh, uh, people who are, you know, have uh, a real um, need and energy around being in service, and then how they're doing that in their lives. And so I am lucky enough to have a couple of people that I've sought out because they didn't land in my lap, and I, and I try to spend time with them, and I see what they do, uh, and I always leave those conversations just, you know, ten feet tall, and and, and we need that. We need those people. Absolutely. Um, we're kind of shifting topics a little bit, but still kind of tying into what we were just talking about is kind of the idea of diversity, right? So mm -hmm. diversity, not in the sense of what people look like or where they're from, but the diversity of cultures, diversity of backgrounds, diversity of uh, professional experiences, uh, incredibly important and a huge topic, incredibly important mm -hmm. for Google, a huge topic in the media these days. How do you kind of tie this idea of diversity into authentic leadership and inspiration and presence? Is, is there a way to kind of tie in what you were just mentioning, bringing in diversity from other folks and, and really kind of bringing that all together in, in a way that makes sense for a company or a family or whatever it may be? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if I can. <laughs> We're all uh, trying, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, uh, the research supports that you know diverse organizations perform better. Sure. Right? We know that at the board level, you know, throughout organizations. Uh, I believe that the reason that it, that's the case is because of the input idea that I just talked about with uh, inspiration. When we see things from people's experience, it just expands our own perspective. It's a, so whatever cultural blinders we have, and you can define culture however you want, um, they get widened when we see things that we previously didn't see because somebody else has helped us see that. Like we've whether through role modeling or being with them or 
discussion or whatever the case is. Uh, so, so we learn a lot more. Uh, people become three-dimensional when they're in front of us, and, and you know we know them, and we can we can understand that more. Um, we're uh, you know a global world. You know, it's it's you know and a trite phrase, but it's true. Right? Sure. We work with people. I work with people all over the world. You guys probably do the same. Uh, and so diversity of everything is important because it just allows us to be in the world and and a, with a, a broader perspective. Sure, perspectives are huge. Getting perspectives from different people and countries yeah. and, and everything, cultures, uh, a huge huge difference maker. What's one piece of advice you would give us as Google, speaking to us as Google today in terms of inspiration? Is there, is there anything you've heard or read that we do good or bad that could potentially be turned into advice that we can walk away, walk away with today? Well, I mean, Google is known for a lot of the things that we just talked sure, about. Yeah. So uh, you guys are lucky because you're sitting in organizations <laughs> like that. I, not a, all of the organizations I work with uh, can say the same. Uh, what I admire from Google from afar, so I don't work in the company, but what I what I see is is just the uh, you, you mentioned the word curiosity before, but that's mm -hmm. what I see. I see just a, a hunger and a curiosity to learn and expand and try new things, uh, and you know when you have that sort of permeating the culture. I mean, even today, so we're having a Google talk. Uh, we talked about earlier, I said, you're in a plumb seat, right? Because you help put these together. That means that you get to learn, you know, a sure. lot about things yep. that you might be, you care about. Uh, but all Google has that opportunity. So I, I think uh, having that kind of mindset uh, and to be, uh, to be an outspoken leader in things that, uh, from a business standpoint in the corporate community, uh, which Google does, uh, frequently uh, is inspiring to a lot of other organizations, and you and you see that you see um, there are a select number of companies, and Google's one of them, can that can put out a pretty um, bold statement, and you see other companies lining up behind them. Sure. Uh, and there's a responsibility with that, uh, but Google seems to you know take it pretty well. Yeah. Well, we do our best. We do our best to, to be inspirational as, as a company and as individual contributors here in the city of Detroit, but it's hard, right? It's, it's, a, it's a simple concept, but putting it into practice, uh, is, is, it, takes, it does take practice itself, mm -hmm. right? It takes practice and understanding and, and cognizance more than anything. Um, I wanted to open up now. I'm sure we've got some questions from the audience. We have a lot of leadership here in the room. I um, wanted to open it up for questions. If anyone has any questions that, that we can ask Christy. Um, I do have mics here if you want to. Corey, if you don't mind running those for us. Thank you. We're on. Oh, I'll break the ice for you, Jason. <laughs> uh, Dave Hoffman, um, and this is one of my, my topics that's close to my heart. I went back to give my MBA sp specifically based on corporate cultures, things like uh -huh. that. Um, I, I'm an ex-athlete, and it's always funny how the best team doesn't always win. It's normally the team that has the most heart, most best leadership, inspiration, yeah. all those kind of things. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I have found kind of time and time again is that natural like that god-given brilliance seems to really hinder your ability to be an inspirational leader you know you get so caught up in in how things work or, or your mind and whatever that you tend to not be as personable or uh, as outgoing mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be the case sometimes here at Google where we we lack a little bit of inspirational leadership because they just that EQ kind of isn't there mm -hmm. so first like what are some of the traits where you can actually help coach someone up into that from a leadership perspective or the other end of the spectrum where somebody might be a little bit more fast and loose so a lot of energy but at the same time needs to find a way to authentically dial it back down so that they can kind of fit into that mold of a leader without losing their their uniqueness or their genuineness sure that's a couple questions yeah. but so uh, but i like where you're going uh, and let me just say that uh, athletes often, people who were former athletes are athletes, uh, often really get this because a lot of it is uh, starts in the inside, the mental game, so really being clear about that. And, and if you have been an athlete a lot of times, I wasn't an athlete, I've heard this, um, that that's been part of the training. Right? It's a positive visualization, um, plays a big role in it. So uh, I'm not surprised to hear the connection that you just made between athleticism and, and, and culture. Uh, so the being in your head problem is an interesting one. Uh, it's kind of a blessing and a curse uh, because often if we're someone who spends a lot of time conceptualizing and maybe that's our personality or maybe we're an introvert and that's how we process or, or whatever the case, um, it means that our first instinct might not be to communicate. 
right? Our first instinct is to, is to step back and, and think about it. Uh, and when I work with leaders like that, which I do all the time because a lot of people are introverts and, and that's, that's where they naturally go, uh, it's to get them out of that um, predisposition that things have to be perfect before I communicate it, right? And so yeah, I'm thinking of, of someone that I worked with several years ago, and so my, one of my pieces of advice to him was, uh, you know, you need to, you need to go for um, intentional transparency is what I called it. Uh, because you think that people are reading your mind, but no one knows what's going on up in here. Uh, and so you need to be very intentional about it. So your first instinct when you get a new piece of information or when you have a plan that's maybe 50% baked, not 100% baked, is to tell people. Like you need to get that knee-jerk reaction because if, if it's just you thinking about it, then it doesn't really shape anything. So, so that's one thing that comes up um, quite a bit if that, uh, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool. Questions, Ashley? Um, I'm gonna hot, hot mic. Here we go. <laughs> How's this better? Okay, great. Um, so, in addition to being an author, you consult and work with mm -hmm. large companies, and so I'm, you know, I'm sitting here kind of thinking about all these principles and how we might uh, push them down through a company like Google or through one of the companies that we support in this room, which are large automakers, yeah. a GM, a Ford, a Chrysler. Um, so when you think about tackling a, a huge corporate client like that, let's say budget was no, op no issue and the CEO <laughs> said, I need your help transforming my leadership, what are, you know, what are some of the levers or the tools that you would use with the company and what do you think would be required to really push this type of inspirational development through a large organization? Is it everything from personal coaching for their leaders mm -hmm. in addition to retreats? And what are sort of the um, levers that you use to help actually push this through in a meaningful way across a big organization? OK, well, first of all, no one ever says you can have all the money you want. Uh, <laughs> but then my brain went pew, 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 pew. Uh, Well, so a couple things. Obviously, I'm a big believer in coaching. So I think there, there is something really powerful. And I became a coach because I had a coach. And, and it just it changed. he changed my life. And so I, I, I wanted to be able to offer that to other people. Uh, and hopefully, I, I don't know if I changed their lives, but I, I try really hard to, uh, to be in service to them. Uh, is that personal coaching changes things because it's, it's just such a unique development opportunity. It's so personalized, and, uh, and it really allows you to ask the questions that you want to ask in a, in a very safe setting. Um, with someone who isn't invested in your outcome, they just want you to be successful. So nobody's trying to game the system. So that's why I think coaching is very effective. Um, but beyond that, if I could work in an organization however I wanted to, what I think is most effective is when um, you introduce concepts to a, a swath of people. So maybe it's uh, all leaders in an in office or, or whatever the case is. Um, so everybody gets uh, sort of the same songbook, if you will. So everybody starts to think about things a little differently. Uh, and then you have some, some breakout cohort groups underneath of that. Um, because I think back to uh, the role modeling and the conversation, I think that's what really starts to get people to think, OK, how can I really embed this in my day to day? Uh, and you get economies of scale that way because the conversation gets richer and everybody gets curious and they start looking at other things. So I think it's a combination of those that can really help shift the culture. Uh, but let me just say that anything that I wrote about in this book or the last book, I always tell people this, it's, it's not hard stuff. Uh, it's, it's not like you read it and you're like, wow, listening, I never thought about listening before. Uh, you know it, we just don't do it. Uh, and so part of my work, what I try to do is really to close that knowing doing gap. So you know it, but then how do you make it easier to actually just do it? Uh, and so I try to make it very accessible for people. And so when I come in and work with teams, that's really what it's about. You know, I'm not there to tell you something you've never heard before. I'm there to get you to do things you probably know you already should be doing, um, but you don't do. Yeah. And, and that's really what it is. Sometimes it's good to have a reminder, you know, for folks in this room and folks across Google, yeah, you, know, you talk about it. These these concepts are not difficult, right? They're yeah, simple concepts. Yeah. It's not rocket science. But a lot of times, to some folks in a company like this, uh, coding uh, search algorithms is very simple. Listening actually is not that simple for them. It's something that they do have to practice, and something yeah. that 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 seems like a very simple concept. 
but outside of kind of what they're used to is it takes a little bit of extra kind of focus and uh, elbow grease to kind of make sure that it happens right. Mm -hmm. Kind of the, the last question I had, because you mentioned this here and, and the answer to Ashley's question was around coaching and you mentioned that you had a coach yourself mm -hmm. that kind of drove you in the right direction. Can you kind of talk about that process a little bit? Because we all, you know, we talk about inspiration, we're talking about presence. Um, I think one thing that we all look for uh, here is, is finding coaches that can help us along our paths as well to mm -hmm. become better uh, inspirational leaders, to become better employees and things like that. Can you talk about that coaching uh, and coachy uh, kind of atmosphere that you just mentioned and, and talk a little bit about your coach and how that person was inspiring to you? Sure. Well, I, I uh, you know, I've been an entrepreneur since I was 27, so I, I didn't have uh, an organization full of people to role model and mentor sure. me. Uh, and and very early on, I got introduced to someone who was a uh, leadership coach for small business owners, and it was it was just immensely helpful. I mean, in so many ways, but but probably the most is that. Uh, it was somebody I could be very frank with, and and he had you know had had a business for you know 20 or 30 years, and so there wasn't anything I came up with that he hadn't already been through five times, sure. you know. So it was really nice just to have a little bit of normalizing of things that were happening, um, but also somebody that could really just push my thinking and and have just sort of no BS uh, allowed in the discussion, you know, it just sort of call you on stuff and, and really make you accountable, but in a very supportive way. And that's a, just a very unusual dynamic to have somebody who will push you, support you at the same time, has experience they can bring that help you understand contextually what's going on, um, and then doesn't have any sort of game in your outcome. So they're not going to fire you if you don't do what, what you just talked about, right? It, it's really you. It's your development opportunity. You do what you want to with it. Uh, and I find with, with my clients now as a coach, uh, you know, my job is to be supportive and my job is to be incredibly honest. So uh, I don't hold back with my clients. I think they need to hear what my observations are. That's what I'm, that's what I'm there for. Uh, and, and I try to really adjust to their learning style so they can hear it in the best way. Um, you know, but my investment is in their success and that's it. And, and I think the best coaches look at it that way. Absolutely. Great. Awesome. Well, Christy, thank you so much for coming in today. We appreciate it. This was very inspiring for us appropriately. Um, again, Thanks. the book, The Inspiration Code, if you guys haven't, grab a, a copy on the way out. I think it's it's not out yet, No, it comes yet, out right? on Thursday. It comes yeah. out on Thursday. So we have advanced copies. How great is that? So um, if you have it, grab a book. You can read it before the general public even gets to put their hands on it. So once again, thank you, Christy, for coming. Sure. And we appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. So. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.